To me, I think the most meaningful thing about CMDA has been the opportunities for mentorship and growth as a Christian physician that it offers. It's so difficult to learn as a student how you're supposed to apply this faith that means so much to you in an environment that, you know, while it says that it's going to be welcoming, frankly, is not always so. And even if it is, it's, it's not always welcoming of the conclusions that your faith may draw you to on what that may mean for patient care or your interactions with your coworkers. Through CMDA, I've been able to find mentors, people who have been down this road before or who are doing it even now to show me what this looks like, how to pray with patients while being respectful of them, how to deal with ethical issues in the workplace, just how to become a, a better follower of Christ. Medicine is just amazing because it provides the opportunity to touch people's lives in such a real way and to be touched by them. And it really reminds us of the, the humanity that we serve, you know, who we are as people and what God did for us and what that means for how we should treat them. And it's been such a blessing to have mentors and peers who are sort of living that story at the same time as I am and to be able to share that together. Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. What a great opening testimony you just heard from our CMDA student member, Thomas Siff, about how CMDA is helping him learn how to incorporate his faith into his healthcare training. Friends, I get to hear those testimonies all of the time. It is so exciting to me. Here at CMDA, our mission is to educate, encourage, and equip Christian healthcare professionals to glorify God. One significant way that we have focused on equipping our members throughout the last several decades is teaching you how to share your faith in your practice environment. On this week's episode, I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Harold Koenig. His name might be familiar to you because he has been a driving force in the research of the importance of spiritual care to the overall health of our patients. He's got some great information to share with you today, so let's listen in to our recent conversation. Well, I'm excited to introduce all of you listening today to my special guest, uh, who has one incredible distinguished bio, Dr. Harold Koenig, Completed his undergraduate education at Stanford University, attended medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, and then completed geriatric medicine, psychiatry, and biostatistics training at Duke University. Along the way, also had family medicine training. He's board certified in general psychiatry, also formally board certified in family medicine, geriatric medicine, and geriatric psychiatry. He's currently a professor of psychiatry and associate professor of medicine at uh, Duke University Medical Center. Uh, has a number of adjunct faculty positions all over the world, actually. From an academic perspective, he has authored almost 600 scientific peer-reviewed academic publications, 100 book chapters, and over 55 books, and has appeared before the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, on the topic of religion and public health has received numerous awards, uh, including one from the American Psychiatric Association, Oscar Pfister Award, and then has been editor of International Journal of Psychiatry in Medicine and is currently the associate editor of the Journal of Religion and Health. So without any further ado, after that bio, Dr. Koenig, welcome to CMDA Matters today. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. Well, I've just been so impressed with all that Duke is uh, doing. And of course, I had your colleague there at Duke, Dr. Far Curlin, who joined uh, me a couple of times last year to talk about his new book in The Way of Medicine and uh, the Center for Theology, Medicine, and Culture. So many things going on at Duke. I can see, I guess, why you landed there and why you flourished on this whole topic of religion and 
Health. What is this Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health at Duke? Tell us about what its purpose is. Well, the purpose of the center is to conduct research on this connection in religious faith and health and to train others to do research in this area. So that's the primary purpose. It's to bring also people from Duke and from around the world together to collaborate in various projects and to write together and to, you know, to try to influence the field of medicine and healthcare with regard to the impact that a person's faith has on their health and well-being. I've been poring over a number of the of those books I mentioned earlier as articles, even a couple of videos, an interview, a couple of interviews recently that you did with our CMDA friend, Dr. Walt Laramore, on his TV program and talking about this whole issue of religion and health. And listeners need to know that uh, the mo- one of the most impressive volumes that I've ever seen, uh, a textbook, I guess, The Handbook of Religion and Health. And I think its third edition uh, from Oxford is coming out soon. Is that right, Dr. Koenig? That is. And this particular edition of the handbook will be, I think, very, very important for the whole field of medicine and healthcare. The reason is because it is so comprehensive. The book is is almost 600,000 words. Wow. It's about 2,000 pages. And my co-authors really give credibility to this work. The second author on the book is Tyler Vanderweel. Dr. Tyler Vanderweel has a doctorate in mathematics from Oxford and uh, public health from Harvard. And he's an endowed professor in the School of Public Health at Harvard. And in fact, He has written the books that statisticians are trained on with regard to longitudinal data analysis. And so he has reviewed everything that I've written in that book, and he has given his credibility to it. And then the third author is John Petit, who is also a professor at Harvard in psychiatry. With regard to applying in clinical practice the the research that has been coming out. So I really think that this is this third edition is really going to put faith on the map here of the medicine and healthcare. I'm hoping it will. That's incredible. When is it coming out, Dr. Koenig? Well, you know, I submitted the manuscript in August of last year, and because of supply chain issues, COVID-19 strikes, apparently Oxford University Press is slow. So I think it's not going to come out until you know, probably summer or maybe even early fall. Well, you mentioned Dr. John Petit from Harvard, and that made me remember that you co-authored with Dr. Petit and Dr. Jennifer Harris one of the books that we published out of CMDA entitled Downcast, A Biblical and Medical Hope for Depression. And I was just really taken aback and just got to know you a little bit better because you tell your own story in that book, uh, Dr. Koenig, about your own dealing with depression when you were in med school. Would you just mind briefly sharing with our listeners uh, what you went through during that time and how you came out of it? Yeah, that was a tough time in life. But, you know, really, that was a key factor in my my own faith. But it, it was a tough time. It was... Uh, You know, life was just kind of very, very dreary. There was nothing exciting about life. It was very dull. I was struggling. I was I was to some degree suffering, not not like many people do, but but I was having a hard time. And, uh, you know, I was searching, searching for an answer, searching for peace ultimately after many other experiences, including being removed or kicked out of medical school for a period and living on the streets of San Francisco and, uh, you know, joining the army briefly and uh, going through several, several relationships, finally came to the living Bible and read the living Bible. I was actually on OB, on the obstetrics rotation. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for women to deliver. And I was, I was uh, a resident in family medicine at the time. During the downtime, I read the Bible and it was just like, it just spoke to me, wow. it just spoke to me and answered literally every question that I had and made me realize that a relationship with God could make me complete. 
that I didn't need anyone else. I didn't have to succeed in my work. I didn't need anything but this connection with God, and that would make me whole and complete. That's been 40 years ago. <laughs> and, Praise God. Uh, yeah, amen. <laughs> And looking over the various books that you've published, Dr. Koenig, I wish I had come across this nice little book. I'm a general surgeon, so I like little small books, not this massive thing from Oxford necessarily, but (laughs) (laughs) your book that you published 20 years ago, uh, Spirituality in Patient Care, Why, How, When, and What, and uh, especially appreciated your talk about boundaries, uh, about excuses that doctors make and not doing spiritual care with their patients. And I've shared many times my testimony that I'm a product of the 80s in terms of med school and, and residency. I just never saw any kind of spiritual care demonstrated for me in the 80s. And you point out that we in the 80s in medicine, it, we just didn't feel like spirituality had any impact upon uh, healthcare or medicine or surgery. But w- things have sure changed, haven't they? They have. They definitely have. Yeah. When I was in nursing school, when I was in medical school, there was no mention at all about a person's religious beliefs or their faith or it, it, that it had any role in their health or healing whatsoever. And when I was in family medicine, when I ex- experienced this transformation in my own faith, I was kind of marginalized because I would give talks to my family medicine department on on religion and health, and uh, they just uh, they just didn't get it. And and part of it has to do with because of our training, we keep our personal faith very separate from our professional lives, and that really doesn't have to be the case. People, our patients, really need to see our faith and to connect with us at that level. Many patients, many patients, some don't. Some don't want to get involved in that area with their physician or their nurse, but probably two thirds of patients do. Well, you mentioned the third edition of Religion and Health. So clearly our members, our listeners, those who more than ever, it seems, I just hear story after story every week, Dr. Koenig, that our members are in the trenches and facing tremendous pushback, especially in certain regions of the country in terms of religiosity and spiritual care and faith within health care. How would you come alongside our members and our listeners and, and help them in terms of what does the evidence show today? Well, with regard to the evidence, it's pretty clear from literally thousands of quantitative studies that a person's religious faith, particularly when practiced regularly, has a, an enormous impact on a person's health, health across the board, all aspects of health. When you, psychological health, mental health, social health, physical health, relationships, I mean, literally behaviors, behaviors, health behaviors, every aspect of health seems to be impacted by a person's faith. And, you know, as far as healthcare professionals, what we can do with everyone is we can take a spiritual history. Every patient deserves to have a spiritual history where We simply ask the person about whether they have any religious beliefs or practices. Is it a a support for them? Are they part of a faith community? And is that supportive? Do they have any spiritual needs that someone can address? Those are very simple questions, and they don't take very long, and and they don't take much time to answer either. And yet it it provides the patient a sense that this, this doctor or nurse is open to discussing these issues with me. That means so much for patients, it, it really does. And for some patients who are, are not receptive, they'll simply uh, answer those questions and that, no, you know, this is not a part of my life. And, and then you go on, you go on with your regular uh, medical care. Many surveys, I think both religious and secular have shown us that the, the nuns, uh, those who have no religious affiliation, that they're on the rise. So what do you think that means for the open doors, the opportunities to discuss whether it's religiosity or spirituality? Are we going to find these opportunities less common now? I don't know, Mike. I don't know. I, I think that there is something within every human being 
that desires to connect with God in some way, whether they acknowledge it, whether they're conscious of it or not. And regardless of these trends, we are going to experience suffering in our lives. And suffering drives us to seek something more, something greater, just in desperation to, to try to get away from, from that pain. So I, I think that uh, regardless of these trends that are going on nationally, internationally, that we should be very sensitive. We should continue to offer our love and our passion for, for God, for Christ, to our patients in ways that are respecting the autonomy of patients. I, I think that shouldn't be a factor. I think people need it. That's the bottom line. I mentioned barriers in, in your handbook, and I appreciate the fact that you say different specialties, especially yours of psychiatry, it's, it can be more challenging in terms of incorporating spirituality and faith because of the nature of psychiatry. And then you mentioned family medicine may lend itself better. I, you, I don't think you felt there was many open doors for us surgeons, but I, I would beg to differ. Wow, there are, there are just so many <laughs> opportunities uh, with respect done, but talk to us today about the boundaries and gray areas in terms of doing faith care with patients. Well, in psychiatry, particularly if you're doing therapy with patients and you're doing it pretty intensely, like on a weekly basis, you have to be careful. You have to be careful because people who have psychiatric problems, serious psychiatric problems uh, because of their childhood, because of, you know, maybe genetics, et cetera, you have to be careful with the boundaries mm -hmm. because I had one experience with, with the patient that I was seeing regularly who is more kind of a borderline patient having a borderline personality disorder who, you know, I, you know, I did pray with her and she said that that created such an intimacy that she began dreaming about me and having fantasies, sexual fantasies about me as a result of that deep intimacy that that prayer created. So that was the one time, I mean, it's really the only time this has ever happened in, in 40 years, but that was, the, that was the one time when I thought, well, I may have, I may have moved a little too quickly there. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, caused that. And, and she was a little bit upset afterwards about it and uh, what that had, had caused. But in general, I, I think as, as a medical professional or, or certainly as a surgeon, um, you're not really seeing the patients that frequently, uh -huh. yes. <laughs> you know, yes. and, and so you can feel, and, and it's more, uh, you, you should free, feel freer to do it just because People are in situations, it's largely situational, and, you know, to, to come alongside them, to, to pray with them, to encourage them, to support their faith, you know, I think in those more situational um, issues, I think is, is very appropriate. I think the secular world, maybe people who push back on what you've, you've been working on and the, your findings over 25 years or more, that P word is is what they would accuse some of, of proselytization. And that shuts, I have seen even great doctors of faith sort of get shut down and intimidated by colleagues talking about they're just proselytizing. When do we move from appropriate spiritual care, do you think, into so-called proselytizing in the setting of healthcare and patient care? You know, first of all, there is a fact that needs to be pointed out here. And that is that most of our patients, or at least the majority are already religious. And they're primarily from a Christian faith. A lot of times what we do is we change our behavior because we're afraid that the 10% or 20% of people who are not particularly religious, we don't wanna offend them. And we certainly don't. But you, know, you don't wanna forget about the other 70 to 80% who have a strong faith or have some level of faith that needs to be supported. And we're also focused on patient satisfaction these days in our institutions. And it seems that patients want it. We really have an advantage over our secular colleagues who really don't feel comfortable with any kind of spirituality or talking about faith with patients. 
in that we actually have higher patient satisfaction scores because the majority of Americans have faith and religion in their lives. You agree? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, see, I think patients, they want their doctors to be priests, to be both pastors as well as doctors, because, you know, health and faith are so strongly connected. I mean, in the early part of our country, most of the clergy were also physicians because it just seemed to be very natural for, you know, if if you're talking about the spirit, you're talking about, you know, a person and faith, you're talking about their mental health, their social relationships, and their physical health. They're all one. They're all connected in some way. So our patients just recognize that it's kind of an intrinsic sense that these areas of the spirit are, are connected to well-being and healing, and they are needed. And, and the doctor, you know, right, is in that position to be able to provide that holistic kind of care, and nurses as well. Well, as we bring this interview to a close, Dr. Koenig, I appreciate the fact that you've worked with our psychiatry section, which is one of our oldest specialty sections at CMDA. They have a great interest in recruiting uh, students, whether pre-professional or in medical school, to consider psychiatry as a future uh, specialty to practice. So I'm going to give you a shot to talk about your specialty here. Uh, Give it your best shot, Dr. Koenig. The reason why I sought psychiatry is I thought, and I I still believe, that if you're really going to focus on integrating religious faith into your practice, that psychiatry is the area that is as close to it as as you could come. And that's why I chose. I I I could see that, you know, spending time with patients who are suffering from psychological issues that they that, that potentially that was the most receptive group of people to what I was offering in terms of sharing my faith because again you have you're addressing exactly those issues that religious faith can help to relieve and to at least help with whether it relieves it completely or not it can help with so you know prescribing medicine and taking care of medical problems, or you know, that was that was fine. But if I could really talk to people, if I could develop a relationship, if I had the time to do that, and psychiatry seemed to be, I mean, right now it's primarily, you know, prescribing medication, but you still have the opportunity, you know, to talk to people and to address those issues that are most important in their healing. And I think that, you know, if you do it delicately and sensitively, connecting them to God is the best thing for them (laughs) and for their healing. Dr. Koenig, you've been an, an amazing role model. There's no question in my mind. I'm praying for God to raise up another dozen of you in the next generation of healthcare professionals. Please keep at it. I hope that your career still has uh, some good mileage ahead of you because of the incredible role model that you have been over the last two to three decades in this area of religion and healthcare, faith and spirituality. Thank you, Mike. You too. What a huge impact that Dr. Koenig has had on the research and the data behind the importance of spiritual care in our patients' lives. As a professor at Duke University, he is one of the foremost voices in the research on the effects of spirituality as well as health. For more information about his Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health at Duke, you can visit spiritualityandhealth.duke.com. Or you can find the link in our show notes today. In one of his research articles, Dr. Koenig wrote, quote, Only in recent times and in developed countries have spiritual and physical healing been separated. However, current research, patient openness, and biblical precedent all suggest the importance and appropriateness of a holistic approach to quality patient care, which includes spiritual as well as medical components, end quote. That's one of the main reasons CMDA developed the new Faith Prescriptions On Demand video series. 
It will teach you to share your faith in ethical and appropriate ways with colleagues and your patients. It will teach you to pray with patients, and that's only the beginning. To get started with the series, which is free to all our CMDA members, just visit the CMDA Learning Center at cmda.org learning. I hope that you were moved by Dr. Koenig's openness in sharing his own struggles with depression. And it is inspiring to hear how God spoke to him in those low moments around the time of medical school. And today he's using his personal experiences to help others. As you heard us briefly mention in our conversation, he was one of the contributing authors to Downcast, Biblical and Medical Hope for Depression, a book that we recently published at CMDA. With compassion developed from their personal and clinical experience as psychiatrists, the authors for Downcast, they tackle the complexities of depression from a multidisciplinary approach. In their thoughtful and practical guide, they weave together scripture with science, theology with cutting edge scientific research, and the stories of many Christians who have suffered to help those with depression find healing. You can get your copy today. Just go to cmda.org slash bookstore. Speaking of our CMDA bookstore, I also want to encourage you to check out Practice by the Book, A Christian Doctor's Guide to Living and Serving. This book was written by Dr. Gene Rudd and Dr. Al Weir and draws on scores of years of experience by compiling content from more than a dozen Christian colleagues. It teaches you how to live a life guided by biblical principles. It covers the waterfront of life from professional to personal, from character to money, from caring for the poor to caring for their families. This book is suitable for both individual as well as group study. You can find that book and so many others at cmda.org slash bookstore. Well, last week I told you about an upcoming conference that we are hosting together with the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary that we're calling Critical Conversations on Identity and Gender. I hope that you mark your calendars to join us in Dallas, Texas on August 5th and 6th for this important event as we consider the theology, science, legal counsel, and pastoral care required to serve people well in the midst of hard discussions about transgenderism and choices about sexual preference. Registration just opened, so visit cmda.org slash events to register today. As we look ahead to those fun summer months, I have some awesome news to share with you. As many of you know, each year in May, we announce our year-end giving campaign. This is a very strategic time for the CMDA ministry, as we depend on the prayers and generosity of many to help us finish our fiscal year strong and be well prepared for the many ways that we believe the Lord wants to use CMDA in the next fiscal year. This year, our goal for May and June is $827,000. Now for the awesome news that I mentioned earlier. A few of our CMDA champions have put together a $320,000 matching gift to encourage all of us to give our best gift of the year in May and June. That's right, the first $320,000 given to the CMDA General Fund by June 30th will be matched dollar for dollar. I wanna thank you for prayerfully considering your gift to help CMDA claim all of this match and then just visit cmda.org slash give in order to make your gift. If you'd like help with where to mail your gift or a gift from your IRA or one of stock, just call 888-230-2637 or you can email a member of our stewardship team by using stewardship at cmda.org. Thanks to the generous support from so many, CMDA has had a busy and impactful year in ministry. Our Faith Prescriptions program was released and we're putting out a new module each month. Campus and Community Ministries has flourished with the addition of student and graduate chapters. Our advocacy department that I call our A-Team has been hard at work on your behalf in Washington, D.C. and across the country in many state houses. 
Bridging the Gap, our small group study designed to help the church address and inspire Christians to courageously stand up for what's morally right according to their biblical beliefs is being offered by congregations across the country. My own pastor's wife this past weekend told me, Mike, one of the books that you told us about by Nancy Piercy has been hugely helpful to me and my older kids on the topic of loving the bodies that God gave us. Both Global Health Outreach, we call GHO, and Medical Education International, MEI, now have mission teams serving internationally once again. We just finished an incredible in-person national convention in Indianapolis with a sold out crowd. And I could go on and on with this list. Most importantly, let me say thank you for being a part of CMDA. You are what makes this 91-year-old ministry so special. Your notes of encouragement to me and our staff have meant so much to all of us this past year. Your prayers and volunteerism continue to inspire us to work diligently to bring the hope and healing of Christ to our world through healthcare professionals. Thank you for considering your best gift today. Well, I'm very excited about next week because I'll be back in a unique interview with Dr. Pavi Rasinen. She's a medical doctor from Finland who's been a member of the Finnish parliament for 27 years. I think you're going to find her story is incredible, and I can't wait for you to hear how she stood up for her religious freedom in the face of criminal charges, a case that's been labeled the Bible Tweet. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for the podcast, you can just email us uh, using CMDA Matters at cmda.org. And if you like our podcast, would you give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform? As I close the program today, I wanted to share one more quote from Dr. Koenig's research. He says, spiritual care is the heart of what whole person healthcare is really about and has the potential to bring vitality back into the patient and into the practice of healthcare. Well, as you interact with patients in the coming days, I hope that you'll keep that statement close to your heart. We are Christians in healthcare. For us, that means spiritual care is just as important and it has the potential to bring healing that has eternal ramifications for your patients and make your work so much more rewarding. Incorporating spiritual care into your practice will help you bring the hope and healing of Christ to the world around you. That's what matters to CMDA and CMDA Matters. We'll see you next week, Jehovah willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.